Hello, Dan. Hi, Dan. Hey there, how are you doing, Suzanne? <laughs> Good, how are you? Good. You sound perfect. Good. Well, one of the things when this, this whole mess hit, uh, my department went out and bought professional microphones for all of the faculty members. Wow. So these are these are recording quality microphones, which is pretty nice. That is. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah. So how are things doing in Rockland County? <laughs> well, you know, um, our numbers are, um, I don't know if they've started to go down, but they definitely leveled off in terms of cases. Mm -hmm. So um, we had quite a large number very quickly. But things have calmed down now, so uh, we're hopeful, you know, it, so we're in the Hudson Valley region. Mm -hmm. and, and until we meet these seven criteria, we won't open. And I think we've met five of them. So it's, it's positive, but it's, it's really Westchester and Rockland that has the preponderance of cases in the Hudson Valley. Right. Yeah. I was seeing uh, some material from the New York Times and it seemed like uh, you folks were, you and Northern New Jersey, Northeastern New Jersey were yeah. a, very much of a group. It makes sense. We're yep. Yep. Tied to the hip with New York City. Yep. Yep. So. Uh, so I have not done a share screen on Zoom yet. So I'm curious as to how this will work. Um, so if I, if I go into my slideshow. I think you pull that up on your desktop and then click on share screen. Right. Let's see if, so if I do that. There we go. Okay, so you're seeing the full screen. Yeah. Okay, good. So we can just leave that up there if that's okay with you? Sure. Okay. Um, oh, that's even better. Now I've got it so that the, the full screen is being showed, but I'm also seeing my normal um, uh, setup. Okay. So that I can see my next slide and that way I <laughs> Oh good. I know what's coming up. All right, good. Never never done this before. So this is good. We're using like four different platforms depending on whose meeting I'm in. Really? Wow. There's there's Zoom, go to meeting, WebEx. WebEx. And then we have um a system that we use for our classes with Rutgers. So, so how many people are we expecting today? Seventy-six. Oh, okay. yeah. very good. Yeah. Now I don't think I have to let people in. I think I want to turn out that light behind me. Yeah, that's probably better. I'm not sure where I want this.
that's better. Okay. Yeah, that is better. So I'm so curious, what, did, uh, did Rockland ever move forward on that um, watershed grant that it got from the state? You know, um, I believe they are. They, uh, they do want to, but I'm not sure of the status right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a big, a lot of effort put into the water conservation plan that was just released in January. So I believe that that uh, RFP is the next project. Okay. But I haven't heard anything lately, so. So you're listed as a co-host, correct? Um, so you can see the number of participants? Right now, the way I have it set up, I'm not seeing that. Okay, that might be at the bottom of the screen. Well, the thing is, the way I have it set up, what I'm seeing is my slideshow. Okay. And then All I'm right. seeing just you and me. Okay. Um, in terms of personnel. So we might want to wait until just a couple of minutes after seven to give people time mm -hmm. to That's fine. get in. Okay. Yep. So I, I'm assuming that what we will want to do is um, is to take questions at the end. Yes. Um, but then they'll have them in the chat room so we don't right. lose track, track of them. Okay. So right. I'll keep track of them for you. Mm -hmm. okay. And what I'll do is I'll start us off tonight, introduce you and the topic, ex um, thank our funders, and um, then I'll explain uh, the chat room at the end. I mean, I'll, I'll do it up front. That's fine. We do find that uh, people are over enthusiastic about uh, registering. <laughs> yes. And then when the time comes, it's like, well, kind of tired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I'll eat dinner instead. Right. And oh, they'll post the slides anyway, so yeah. I can just look at it later. <laughs> right. and, yeah. Well, I have, I have done that sometimes when I know perfectly well that I can't make it because it's in conflict with something else on my schedule, but I register anyway because I can always go down and see it at some point. You know. It's definitely an advantage of these online programs. Yeah, definitely. Well, the big question we're facing is going to be, what does Rutgers do in the fall? Oh, they haven't decided? No. No, they're staying mid-June for a decision. Not sure, really, that it's going to be any uh, clearer by then, but... Hmm. Oh, okay, that's where it went. I found the chat room. Okay. Is that sometimes I think it's at the top of people's screens, other times, oh, wow. Well, as soon as I, uh, what happened was when I started sharing the one screen, the whole thing moved over to that screen. And so that's, I needed to find that.
So we do have um, 19 people who have uh, signed in, but we'll be waiting till a few minutes after seven uh, because we have quite a few more who have registered. Good evening all, uh, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes, um, still giving time for uh, people to sign in.
Dan, shall we get started? Ready when you are. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation. My name is Suzanne Barclay, and I'm the Executive Director of Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rockland County. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight, we are collaborating with the Rockland Municipal Planning Federation to bring you a presentation by Dr. Daniel Van Abs on achieving sustainable water resources here in Rockland. You may have heard Dr. Van Epp speak, or you may have heard of him because he's done a lot of work in the county recently for the Rockland County Water Task Force, but I will let him introduce himself shortly. Tonight's program is funded by a grant from the School of Integrative Plant Science at Cornell's College of Agriculture and Life Science, known as CALS. We're offering a series of workshops addressing three major environmental issues here in the county an overabundance of deer, rampant invasive plant species growth, and a limited water supply. So in Rockland, even though a third of the county is protected parkland, deer can be found in suburban backyards, village downtowns, as well as in our parks and woodlands. And because they need to eat between eight to 12 pounds of vegetation every day, they're consuming and destroying the understory, uh, what we think of as the weeds and wild, wildflowers. And they're changing the ecology of our environment, neg negatively affecting birds, rodents, insects, as well as people. Invasive plant species have also established themselves throughout the county. From the Phragmites you have seen that have overtaken the Puremont Marsh, the Japanese knotweed we see along our rail trails and barberry along the Palisades Interstate Parkway. But since they provide habitat and food for wildlife, you might be asking, what's the problem with these plants? Actually, they don't always provide food or habitat. And many of our native birds, insects and rodents can't eat the leaves or the stems or the berries. And some plants like the ubiquitous garlic mustard, which is now in bloom, is allelopathic, meaning that they release chemicals that actually inhibit the growth of other plants. So not all of these plants are in fact benign. But tonight we're here just to focus on our water supply in Rockland County. Our drinking water supply is essentially limited to the rainfall which falls within our borders and is captured in our reservoirs and absorbed into our aquifers and wells. In January, you may be aware that the Rockland County Water Task Force released their newly created conservation plan. And in that plan, there are specific roles for our land use board members to understand our water supply, to understand the impact of new development on that supply, and to help protect and conserve it. And that is what Dr. Van Abs is here to discuss. So uh, Dr. Van Abs will begin his presentation shortly. And after that, uh, which should be about an hour, we'll open the floor up for your questions. And because we have almost 50 people, we're gonna be using the chat box um, for your questions. So if you haven't used chat before, if you look at the bottom of your screen, typically there's a little bubble, a white bubble at the bottom. Underneath the word says, it says chat, you click on that. It gives you a space to type your question. You press enter and then we can all see your question. Uh, and I'll make sure that uh, Dr. Van Ab hears it. Then after the Q&A, um, tomorrow, in fact, I'll be emailing all of you a link to a survey that uh, I hope you will um, complete and give us your feedback on it. And in fact, if you wish to receive credit uh, for attending tonight's session from the Rockland Municipal Planning Federation, you'll need to complete that survey. So again, thank you very much for joining. And now um, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Van Abs. Thank you all. Um, <laughs> I was going to say it's nice to be back in Rockland County, but it's only virtually. So uh, I enjoyed my work with uh, with Rockland County when we had an opportunity to uh, to help with the um, preliminary assessment of the watersheds for the Ramapo and Hackensack River basins. And I'm going to be using some of that work in my discussion tonight, but adding a lot of additional material. 
So let me introduce myself to those who um, are not familiar with, with my background. Uh, I have a, a long, long history of involvement in watershed management and land use management kinds of issues. I spent a career with the state of New Jersey as a, a manager for the most of that time, dealing with water resources management um, and watershed protection and regional land use management in three different agencies. And then I thought I was going to retire. I have failed retirement, um, but not miserably. I have failed retirement joyfully. Uh, I've been with Rutgers University now um, for eight years uh, as an academic, dealing with, again, many of the same issues, environmental and water resources planning and management and so on. Uh, so that's basically who I am. Uh, I'm going to be relying fairly heavily on these two pieces of work. Uh, one is a report for the American Planning Association by um, friends of mine, um, says Nick Elmer and Graf, called Planners and Water. And if you in the planning field have not seen this uh, planning advisory services report from the American Planning Association, I would strongly recommend that you get it and, and read it, use it. The other is the report that I was involved with with my team um, back in 2017. It's amazing that it's now two and a half years later. So we're, I'm going to be drawing from both of these plus some additional information that you'll see over the time. So let me start out with a, a very basic uh, statement, and that is we tend to think of water in discrete bundles, surface water, groundwater, storm water, drinking water, wastewater. The problem is it's all water. It's water in different places at different times with different kinds of contaminants, but it's all water. And so one of the things that we should recognize is that water is really just one resource. And where it happens to be is a matter of timing in its flow. So what that means, of course, is that whenever we change one piece of the water resources system, we're changing most pieces, if not all pieces of the water resources system. And so development, which of course is, as planning board members and such, you have a, a lot of involvement with, development changes ground and surface water resources. It changes the volume of them, their peak flows, the timing, the quality, and so on. And so nationally, there is a move toward what's called a one water concept. And the idea is to get ourselves out of these silos, this notion that we we manage stormwater as it has no relationship to surface water or groundwater, or we manage wastewater as if it has no relationship to um, streams, that sort of thing. So the idea behind One Water, um, I won't go through this in detail, but the, the basic thought is that all water has fail, value. There is no such thing as waste water. It is just water that we haven't figured out how to use yet. Um, and that's certainly true in Rockland County. The idea is to have a systems approach, a watershed approach, and to think of things that are integrated solutions as opposed to one piece at a time solutions. Likewise, I would want to make the point that planning is something that is not a document. It is a process. And so if you're making development decisions, 500 isolated development decisions will have an effect, but it doesn't comprom uh, does not comprise a plan. A plan, if you have a plan, a master plan or a comprehensive plan, if that isn't driving decisions, then it isn't really a plan. It's, hmm, I don't know what you would call it. It's, it's maybe a policy document, but it's not really a plan at all. Nope, sorry about that. Um, and the, the additional point here is that if you do planning and development review without consideration for water resources, you are missing a very fundamental aspect of our society. Our society depends on water. It depends on water infrastructure. It depends on understanding how water flows and how it interacts with us and how we interact with it. With it. All of this takes time and money, of course, which is one reason why many people don't deal with it. But on the other hand, if we don't deal with it, it's going to cause problems that also take time and money. 
And so the, the idea is to get in front of these issues first and not react to them later. So water isn't a side issue, and that's what I'm going to be talking about a lot. The hope is that people will see a way to incorporate water in their community's future vision. Sustainable water systems are fundamental to the economy, to the social structure, and to the environment of our communities, not just to the environment. If we focus on the environment only, then we're missing two thirds of the issue because it also has social importance and economic importance. And so the question is, what does your community want to be and how could water play a part in that vision? And as we're thinking about this, we need to recognize that we're essentially talking about forever. Think about it. We put infrastructure in place that is going to last for a hundred years, some of it, before we replace it. And when we replace it, we're likely to replace it pretty much in kind. So that's, as far as human society goes, that's forever. Buildings that we put up are going to last 50, 70, 100 years, more than that. For society, that's essentially forever. So we need to be thinking about this as a way of getting it right forever by doing it right the first time. So let me start out with some basics. And this may be overview for some people. Um, don't fall asleep, <laughs> stick with me. But I wanted to make sure that everybody was pretty much on the same page with regard to how we, we deal with water resources. And the fundamental way we deal with water resources is with watersheds. And these are the land areas where all of the surface runoff goes down to a single point of exit. And so all the streams that connect with each other and eventually flow into a single point and then go out, that is the watershed. Each one of these little streams, and I think you can see the, my cursor, I hope you can see my cursor. Suzanne, does that show up on your screen? If I have my cursor going around? No. No. Okay. All right, so each, uh, then I won't use the cursor to point at things. Each of these small streams has a watershed. When two streams join together, that's a larger watershed. When three streams join together, that's a larger watershed, and so on. So here's a good example of the red circled area is basically um, encompassing a small watershed, which has a number of very small streams that are all flowing um, into uh, one into the next down to a single point of exit. And so that's a watershed. So what are we talking about here? Well, what we're talking about is um, really three fundamental watersheds in Rockland County. <clears throat> the Passaic River Basin comprises much of the southern um, and western section of the county. <clears throat> and that's the Ramapo River to the west, the Mawa River, which is a tributary to the Ramapo but connects with it in New Jersey, and then the Saddle River, which is a portion of the Passaic River Basin that uh, flows into the Passaic well downstream of the Ramapo. Then you have the Hackensack River watershed and its tributary, the Pascac. And then to the north and on the eastern side of the county, you have the tributaries to the Hudson River and to the Hudson River estuary. So that's how somebody like me sees Rockland County. I'm not looking at municipal boundaries because municipal boundaries don't affect how water flows, watersheds do. So from a water resources perspective, watersheds are fundamental to our thinking. The second thing that's fundamental to our thinking in dealing with water and watersheds is where does the water come from and where does it go? And so this is the only equation you're going to see in the entire slideshow. It is a very simple one. Anybody who's been involved in microbiology can see the mnemonic here, Petri, as in a Petri dish. Um, but it's precipitation equals evaporation plus transpiration plus runoff plus infiltration. And I'm gonna explain each one of these concepts. People 
make changes to this equation because we withdraw water and then we return the water to the, um, to the environment in various ways. So what does this look like? Well, this, you may recognize this from grade school. I'm sure all of you have seen the hydrologic cycle at some point. And you're dealing with precipitation coming down. Some of it moves over land, becomes runoff. Some of it penetrates into the ground and becomes groundwater. Some of it is immediately taken up by plants and is transpired. And some of it is evaporated from the Earth's surface. The key point here with regard to water resources management is that we do not know today how much precipitation we're going to get a year from now. The amount of runoff we get is changing all the time. The amount of infiltration we get is changing all the time. The amount of evaporation we get changes all the time. And so we think of these as averages, but they're not. They're not. They are very, very dynamic systems and they're always changing. So precipitation, that's the fundamental. If it doesn't come down from the heavens, then we don't have it to work with. So what's happening with regard to precipitation? Well, the interesting thing here is that we have had and we are projected to have more and more heavy rain events maybe not so much of a change in the total average rainfall, but more of that rain is going to be coming in heavy storms. That has a big impact on a lot of things, how we deal with stormwater, the amount of runoff we get, the amount of infiltration we get. The other, the flip side is that we're anticipating an increase in the frequency of droughts, not necessarily an increase in the severity of the largest droughts, but an increase in the frequency of smaller, sharp droughts. And that's going to have, um, again, a very significant effect on our water resources. Let's think about evaporation. We know perfectly well that the temperatures in this area have been rising, and when temperatures rise, evaporation increases because it's moisture moving up into the air. The warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold. Transpiration, same sort of issue. Transpiration is movement of water through plants and up into the air. The warmer it is, the more transpiration you can get from plants. So what's happening? Well, this is a graph from New Jersey. Very similar situation from North Jersey to Rockland County, increasing temperatures over time. And what's interesting is that the winter months are showing the effects more than the summer months. So the average temperature is going up, but the winter averages are going up faster. Um, for the coastal part of Rockland County, sea level rise is also going to be a, a, an issue. And so there are this, there's the scenarios for that. So, Again, we're seeing more severe storms, more heavy storms, and we're seeing increases in temperature. Those things are connected because the warmer temperatures allow for more moisture in the air, gives more energy to the storms, and so you have the more severe storms. Runoff. The more rainfall you have and the more intense the rainfall is, the more runoff you're going to have. And the result is something like this. This is from, I believe, Hurricane Irene back in 2011 um, or somewhere right around there. Uh, but at any rate, major storm. And what you can see here is the Ramapo River running along about four feet in terms of gauge height. Storm hits and boom, from four feet to almost just about 16 feet, 12 feet increase in the, the flow of the stream and then a gradual taping off. That's the runoff. That's what you're looking for here. All right, infiltration. So what is infiltration? It's simply the movement of water from the land surface through the soil layer and down into what's called the saturated zone or groundwater. That water is fundamentally important and I'll explain how that works. But groundwater is the lifeblood of 
our water resources system. We tend to think of surface water. That's because we're very visual. Surface water is something we can see. Groundwater, we can't see. But groundwater is, I would argue, more important to the system. And then with regard to consumptive uses, this is something that we do as humans. We take water out of the system and we use it. Some of it never comes back to the local environment. Those are called consumptive uses. But sometimes we use water and we do bring it back to the environment. And that's where we have return flows from sewage treatment plants and so on. And the net result is this. So here we have 10 years worth of stream records for the Ramapo River at Ramapo, New York. And what you see is there are some very high periods in terms of discharges. There are very low periods. Look at the difference here. The highest high period is about 15,000 cubic feet per second. The lowest low is about eight cubic feet per second. Eight to 15,000. That's a huge difference in terms of the flows. There are stresses that are involved in both of those. Of course, when you have the very high flows, you're having flooding. When you have the very low flows, you're stressing the ecosystems and you're stressing your groundwater supplies, which is a, an interesting aspect of this. So let me talk about this. Here's a stream. This one's in New Jersey, sorry. Um, but it, no precipitation whatsoever from January 3rd through 10th. No snow on the ground. There's no melting of snow or ice. Why is the stream still flowing? And the answer is groundwater. This is all water that was groundwater within a day prior. How does that work? So infiltration, as I said, moves through the soil zone down into the saturated zone. That can be moving through sand or clay or fractured rock or limestone caverns, whatever it happens to be. And as it comes in, it immediately starts moving. It moves toward a point of lowest pressure. And in Rockland County, the point of lowest pressure is a stream. So groundwater is fundamental to stream flow in Rockland County and in all of this region. What do I mean by fundamental? In a natural system, over 75% of the total stream flow is groundwater moving into the stream, not runoff, not runoff. In fact, in a fully wooded stream system in this region, maybe 10% of the water in the stream flow total over a year is runoff. And the rest of it is all groundwater. So it's water that's penetrated into the surface of the land and then has moved to the stream. That's important because groundwater flow to streams goes much slower and much smoother. So let me show you what I mean. Here we have that same graph, Ramapo River back in 2011. You see the yellow or gold circled area. This is base flow, what's called base flow in a river. And that base flow is groundwater. Groundwater that has moved into the surface water and becomes the stream flow. Then you have the runoff. Runoff is around for a few days. And then it goes away. It goes downstream. But the base flow continues during that entire time. And so I've shown a dashed line where you would have this continued base flow. Notice that it's increasing. Well, the reason it's increasing is because some of that water has penetrated down into the ground during the storm and it increases the base flow and eventually it will taper off. So base flow is continuous, runoff is discontinuous. And so it's base flow that we're relying on for our water supplies. We can rely on that in two ways. One is we can pull water from the stream the other is that we pull water from wells. And this diagram from the USGS shows you how that works. In a natural setting, all the groundwater eventually moves to the stream. When you put a well in, what you're doing is you're capturing part of that flow. And so that reduces the amount of water that goes into the stream. You can get to the point where you're pulling so much water from the well that you actually reverse the flow and you have water moving from the stream into 
the well. That's what you have in the lower Ramapo aquifer in the Suffern area of Rockland County. You actually have move, movement of water from the Ramapo River to the well instead of from the groundwater into the surface water. All right, so let me talk very quickly about water quality issues, um, just some of the major concerns, not only in Rockland County, but around the country. One of them is sediments. People don't tend to think of sediment as a water pollution issue, but it's actually the worst water pollution issue in the country. We lose more stream miles to contamination from sediments than pretty much anything. And they can do a lot of damage, burying bottom habitat and, and filling ponds and lakes and so on. So sediments is a big issue and that comes from erosion, um, sediment movement from the land into the stream and also from erosion of the streams themselves. And we've all seen this with streams that are eroded on with banks on both sides that are just pretty much straight up and down. That's a sediment problem. Solid and floatable materials, otherwise known as garbage, trash, litter, all of those highly technical terms. Um, we see this again all the time. And uh, plastic materials are very high on the list of solid and floatable materials that we see in, in our streams. Nutrients and eutrophication, this is a, a great uh, photo, if I do say so myself, because I took it, um, of eutrophication at work. It's excess nutrients causing the plant life in a water body to just boom. And when they do, you get very high oxygen levels during the daytime when the plants are pumping out oxygen, and then at night, the oxygen level crashes and you can get fish gills. Where does that come from? Well. These are results from New Jersey, but I will be willing to bet that the issue in Rockland County will be much the same. Uh, phosphorus is a major freshwater uh, nutrient pollut or pollutant, and we tend to put a lot of phosphorus on our lawns. It's called fertilizer. If one bag will do a good job, two bags will do twice as good a job, right? Well, no, not really. Um, but we tend to get very high levels of phosphorus because of that. And when that then moves into the surface waters, we get explosions of plant life. The other issue, of course, um, toxic, hazardous, carcinogenic substances. And these are thought of as industrial contaminants, but we are finding more and more that personal care products um, are harming wildlife, are harming water quality, and they're coming from septic systems and they're coming from sewage treatment plants. So it isn't just industry. It isn't just landfills. It's also um, us directly. Stream impairment, I've mentioned this a bit. Um, so we can have stream impairment from a lot of reasons. Too much flow because we have a lot of stormwater coming into the streams. Too little flow because we've lost base flow. We're not getting enough movement of water into the stream channel cutting and riparian vegetation losses. So Rockland County is very much like Northern New Jersey. You have some wonderful streams up there. Um, some of them are really good for trout. You want to kill a trout stream very easily, cut the vegetation, the, the woody the forest vegetation from both sides of the stream, open it up to the sunlight, that will damage the stream very badly. All right, so let me give a little bit of an overview to what we found in Rockland County. Um, tale of two watersheds, if you will. One is the Ramapo watershed. And from what you can see here, the Ramapo watershed has a lot of green space. So it's a relatively undeveloped watershed, 52% forested as of 2012. That's probably no longer true. Um, bit of residential and a fair amount of commercial road um, industrial, especially down in the the southeast corner and in the very, very northern section up in Orange County. So there's been more and more development moving into this area, and that is a matter of concern from a water resources perspective. So these are the issues that we found um, uh, some good things. We have a lot of preserved lands providing a buffer to streams, but there are some degradation issues and the Buried Valley aquifers in the Ramapo and Mawa river areas are very stressed. You also have some flooding issues because you have these flat valley bottoms caused by the glaciation. And so they're prime areas for flooding. The Hackensack 
very different situation. Heavily developed, 12% forested in 2012, instead of 52 for the Ramapo. 46% residential, instead of about 16, I think the Ramapo was. And about a similar amount of commercial roads and so on, industrial. So there's development occurring all through it, but um, there are a few areas of green space, but just a few. So Hackensack, heavily developed watershed, degradation of stream quality, um, but the fact that it's a heavily developed watershed means that there's not gonna be a lot of greenfield development, as we call it, um, development in, on open space. It's gonna be more um, modification of existing development and the impacts of existing development. So redevelopment, existing development, those are the big issues. Um, so, so let's look at the water quality a little bit. Again, if you look at the Hackensack, what you see is a lot of streams in red and those are impaired streams. If you look at the Ramapo, what you see is a lot of streams in the blue. Those are relatively unimpaired watersheds. Very significant difference. Now, this slide also shows the other watersheds, the Saddle River and the Hudson River uh, tributaries. And what you see for the Hudson River tributaries, for instance, is also a fair number of impaired streams. So that's a, that's a big issue on the eastern side of the county. This slide compares open space to the areas of impaired streams. And lo and behold, in the western area in the Ramapo, you have all of this wonderful green space. And within it, you have tucked quite a number of very nice streams from a quality perspective. All right, um, so let me move now into how do we manage these issues? Again, I'm pulling this from the planners and water and then tying into it information from Rockland County. I'm going to be covering all of these issues, so I'm not going to go through them at the moment. So let's start with existing water supplies. The question for existing water supplies is always how much water is there? So we have in Rockland County, one major water uh, reservoir that is there for the purpose of storing water during high flows that can be used for use in other time periods. And then you have surficial aquifers. That means basically these are aquifers or groundwater that is close to the surface of the land that isn't contained by anything. And then you have all of the stream and ecosystems that depend on surface water resources that are supported by those aquifers. So DeForest Lake or Lake DeForest, depending on, I guess, I don't know, your religion or something like that. I've seen it both ways. This is primarily a supply for the eastern areas of Rockland County. It's a heavily developed watershed. If you remember the slides that I showed you before, development all around that reservoir. And that's a concern because among other things, it brings things like phosphorus, but it also brings things like road salts, um, which are an issue for Suez water. And so the question here is what land use decisions are needed to protect this water source so that it can remain as a viable reservoir over the course of the years. In terms of groundwater, all of those red circles and blobs show you where the wells are. They are all over the county. 70% of the water supply in Rockland County is from wells. And so those wells are competing with the stream ecosystems for water. The more we draw down the wells, the more we're drawing water from surface water and the lower the stream flows are. The more we put, um, want to keep water in the streams, the less we can draw down the wells. And so there's this, this balancing process that has to go on. Most of these wells are in developed areas. And so the question is, again, how do we protect these water supplies? And you have lost, in Rockland County, you have lost wells to water pollution, including salt. Too much salt getting into the wells have closed a couple of wells down. So that's an issue. So the, what are the planning and design issues? Um, knowing how much water you have, of course, protecting the water supply availability, 
And that's through maintaining recharge or even improving water recharge because you've lost recharge through development of past decades. How can you get some of that recharge back? And reducing runoff, because if we can reduce runoff, that means that we're holding the water back and it has more potential to go into the ground. Water quality controls, um, septic system density, and also the quality of the water that gets infiltrated. And redevelopment, can you inf um, use redevelopment as a way of improving the situation, not just making it not worse, but can you use redevelopment to actually improve the situation? So this is something that I'm gonna do after each basically section. Um, what can your municipality do to improve the situation? And what can you ask the applicant in your planning board sessions? So from a municipality perspective, you're looking at your planning, your zoning, your local ordinances, site plan, subdivision review, and so on. How are they ensuring protection of natural re uh, stream flows? That requires protection of recharge. How can you then protect that recharge? And how can you ensure that the water quality is being protected? From an applicant perspective, you can ask questions like, how will the design ensure that recharge is maintained or enhanced? And how will the design ensure that ground and surface water quality is maintained and enhanced? If you're not asking these questions, then you're probably losing ground instead of gaining. We're losing water instead of gaining. So let's now talk about the water distribution systems. Um, every, the water supply infrastructure is a combination of the source area, the well, the reservoir, treatment, storage of treated water, distribution system and line capacity. It can be owned by multiple entities as you're moving from one to the next. And each piece of this has limitations. From a municipal perspective, you're gonna be more focused on um, can water get to a development that's being proposed. So in Rockland County, most of the developed area is in public water systems and Suez is the dominant supplier, 90% of the total of Rockland residents. There's currently sufficient capacity um, from everything that I've seen, but the capacity is constrained. It's not an infant situation and it is not going to be an infinite situation ever. You also have several smaller systems, Village of Nyack relying on the Hackensack River, Suffern is on wells, and Hilbur, Hilburn purchases water from Suez. So Suez is ultimately the source of that water as well. Then you flip to the wastewater, because of course, if you're gonna generate all of this water supply and send it out to customers, you need to be able to collect it. So the system in reverse, collection system, treatment facility, and then discharge to somewhere. Um, again, each of these pieces has capacity limitations. So the question is, can the development that's being proposed fit within the system. Again, for public sewer systems, nearly all of your developed areas have sewer. <clears throat> There's a real benefit to that because you're centralizing the sewage. You can have efficient sewage treatment plant that's monitored, you maintained, you make sure that it's working properly. But there are drawbacks, one of which is water transfers. You're often taking water from the upstream portion of a watershed bringing it down by gravity through the distribution system and the collection system, and then treating it and discharging it at the bottom of the watershed. Well, that means that most of the stream miles in that watershed are losing water, and only the very bottom is getting that water back. Um, and then that results in a concentrated discharge to the streams. So the Western Ramapo Advanced West Wastewater Treatment Plant and the Suffern Wastewater Treatment Plant discharge to streams that are already showing impairment. The other treatment plants discharge to the Hudson River. And so that's a concern, of course, but less of a concern because it's less constrained. There are, um, as I understand it, a few rural areas which have septic systems and so, or groundwater discharges. And so that's an issue with regard to its effect on groundwater quality. So what are the planning and design issues? The one that I will tell people that I tell planners all the time, planners tend to assume that the utilities are in charge of all that. 
and they'll just deal with it. You need to interact with utilities. You need to understand what their limitations are. Don't just assume that they're going to be able to handle every demand that might come at them because that won't necessarily be true or it won't be true at any sort of a reasonable cost. So you need to be interacting with them. Septic system density where it might be uh, value. And this one, um, utility service area efficiency, this is one that people tend not to think about in planning boards and municipalities. If you have a mile of sewer and it has 20 customers on it, or you have a mile of sewer and it has 200 customers on it, the cost of building in that, maintaining that sewer system per customer is very different. And so figuring out ways of reducing the cost per mile per customer of pipeline for both construction and maintenance is of value. Spreading development out, low density, but sewer is a very good way of increasing your sewer rates fairly quickly. As I say here, there are, these are choices. They're not absolute answers. There's no bright line between good, bad, acceptable, unacceptable, but they're questions worth asking. So from a municipal perspective, are your future demands going to remain within available capacity? Are the pipelines capable of meeting increased demands? You may have enough supply, but yet the pipelines are too small to take on a significant increase in demand in one area or another. And will the ultimate development pattern and density allow cost-effective infrastructure? If not, you're putting a burden on future ratepayers. They may not be paying it through their property tax, but they'll be paying it through their utility bill. For the applicant, you have every reason to ask them how water demands and sewer generation are being handled. If it's septic systems, how will water quality be ensured? And are they developing, are they designing the development so that it isn't a cost effective way of managing um, the system? Stormwater. We have a lot of existing stormwater systems in Rockland County, just like anywhere else that's been under development for decades. And um, a lot of them, most of them, the vast majority of them, I guess would, I would say, were put in place before there were any really rigorous controls on stormwater management. And the result is stream degradation, water quality issues, street flooding, loss of groundwater recharge, um, and so on. These are all significant issues and they're going to be very difficult to deal with in the long run. So we have an awful lot of old thinking and old technology out there. The idea was to get the runoff to a stream as fast as you possibly could with no control over anything. Um, and so the questions that we face in Rockland County are one, how do we prevent, uh, how do we avoid doing that for new development? But then how can we use redevelopment as a way of improving the situation so that we are actually retrofitting our stormwater system and resulting in better um, protection of our streams and our water supplies. This is a map that I thought was a lot of fun to develop. Each one of these little green dots on this map is a catch basin in Rockland County. Every single one of those catch basins runs to a stormwater outfall into the stream system. And um, so what can you do about this? Green infrastructure is a concept I hope you've encountered, managing stormwater systems as systems. Stormwater systems aren't just one development at a time. They aren't one catch basin at a time. So these are things that you can deal with. Now, green infrastructure, these are just some examples. I'm not going to go through them in any depth, but there's great material out there. And I'm sure that um, Cooperative Extension in Rockland has access to all the same materials that I would get from Rutgers Cooperative Extension. And, and so I will leave you to, to get it that way. So what are the planning and design issues? Remember I said that we're getting more heavy storms? Stormwater systems tend to be, pipelines for instance, tend to be based on the, like the 25 year storm. Well, the 25 year storm of 1970 isn't the 25 year storm of today. Today's 25 year storm is bigger. So we need to be working with current statistics, current design standards. 
to recharge protection, water quality controls, peak discharge uh, velocities, total discharge volume. There are some areas where they have decreed that a new development may not have any more stormwater runoff than pre-development. No more stormwater runoff than pre-development. That's a pretty stringent standard, but it makes a lot of sense from a hydrologic perspective. The other issue is can you use stormwater management systems as an amenity? If you have a catch basin that goes to a pipe that goes to an outfall, there's no amenity there. But if you use green infrastructure, like these two examples on this slide, I would argue very strongly that those are community amenities. They make the place look better. And that improves the value of a community. So the idea here is to use stormwater as a resource and to view it as a resource. So for your design ordinance, does it use update storm frequency information? Have you updated the 25 year storm and so on? Does it ensure that these things are dealt with, all the things that I mentioned before? And finally, does it ensure proper long-term maintenance? The tendency in stormwater systems of the past, as we've been, we put them in place and then we ignore them until they break, at which point we fix them. But if we have long-term maintenance, then that's a lot better for us. So the applicant can be asked some of these questions. First, of course, do they meet all the state and ordinance requirements? Has green infrastructure been maximized? Not just, yeah, we'll, we'll put in a rain garden, but maximized. And who will be responsible for stormwater system maintenance and how? Then there's land uses in the wrong places. Um, Rockland County, like so many places, has a number of areas where you get significant flooding along streams. And it's no surprise. Look at the map on the left. The darker the, the gray there, or black, the more densely developed the impervious cover is. And all of that very dense impervious cover results in flash movement of stormwater into streams, which results in increased flooding. So that raises issues. We should recognize that the purpose of a floodplain is to flood. We don't like doing that as a society. We'd much prefer having floodplains be used for useful economic purposes, development, you know, that sort of thing. But the purpose of a floodplain is to flood. That's why it's there. That's why it is a floodplain. And so the idea is just to keep the development out, to reduce the amount of development that's already in there and where it makes sense, and to, um, through redevelopment, either lift the development higher or move it out of harm's way. And so here are some questions for the municipality. Does your municipality participate in the FEMA community rating system? You can get reduced flood insurance rates for your community if you are part of that system. Most municipalities aren't, but they should be. Does your zoning and ordinances prepare, uh, prohibit floodway development and strictly limit floodplain development? And do you address the potential for larger floods? Why, when I say larger floods, I mean bigger than you've seen in the past. We should recognize that there is very significant potential that the biggest flood you've ever seen isn't the biggest flood you will ever see. From an applicant perspective, how are they going to avoid flood hazards? Will redevelopment reduce flood hazards? An interesting question tends not to be thought of, but if you're going to put in a development, can people get in and out of that development during a bad flood? If not, should that development really be there? So these kinds of issues. Then I'm gonna deal with all four of these in quick succession, um, all side to the issue of demands. In Rockland County, you've had ongoing population growth, but at the same time, you've had a gradual reduction in the per capita demands for water. And the result has been a gradual increase in demands over time. But the bigger issue from my perspective is peak demands. Peak demands in the summer times is when they occur, and they are prim primarily a result of outdoor water uses, lawn irrigation, and that sort of thing. So why? Why is this an issue? 
And the answer is it really stresses both the aquifers because you're drawing down on those aquifers very hard during the summer and you're drawing down on reservoir supplies during the worst time of the year, during the summer, when it's already going to be more stressful. Um, the map on the, the left side shows development that occurred from 1992 to 2011 in the, um, both in the two watersheds, the Ramapo and the Hackensack, but also in the other areas, in, in, you can see it in the shaded area. Um, there's been a lot of infill development happening, but there's also been a movement of new development into the Ramapo watershed where there previously was very little. Um, and the right hand um, map shows you where the more dense development is, that's the red, and then the pink is the uh, less dense uh, development, primarily residential and so on. One of the reasons I raise this is that dense development uses less water per person than low density development. And I'm not talking about high rises. When I say high density, I'm talking about five units per acre. Medium density is about three to five units per acre. Low density is probably less than two units per acre. But because the low density development has more lawn space, the tendency is to have um, significantly more uh, demand. I've done very intensive research on this and it shows very, very clearly. What's interesting to me is that the high and medium density development are pretty much the same in terms of water demand. So you don't have to go very dense before you start getting these benefits. This is a map from Rockland County's comprehensive plan from 2011, and it shows you the areas that they identified as being potentially uh, available for development. Again, you see in the Ramapo watershed, uh, larger chunks, but also some areas up in the Hudson watersheds in, um, I guess that's Stony Point. So it's, it's a variety of possibilities here, but um, I will say that the Ramapo watershed probably has the greatest constraints on water availability, sewer capacity, and, um, and its wells, because those wells are drawing from the Ramapo River in part. Drivers for population uh, for change um, in water demands and therefore also sewer demands, you're growing. You, um, current population of the county is actually higher than the county estimated in 2011 that it would be by this year. They thought 3,018 or 318,000 and you're up over 325. So where are you gonna get? Well, I don't know, I'm no, I'm no forecaster, but the odds are that it's going to grow. Economic growth and business demands can increase demands. Um, but on the other hand, I again have no crystal ball with regard to how the pandemic is going to affect this. And you're going to be facing infrastructure costs for a number of reasons. One is aging infrastructure, meeting new regulatory requirements, and also changing public expectations for service levels. What does this do with regard to planning and design issues? If you can minimize yard irrigation demands, that's going to work in your favor in the long run. If you can promote indoor water conservation through the design of development, that's going to benefit you. As I mentioned, um, dense development uses less per capita, but the other thing denser development can do if you have commercial operations or apartment complexes or whatever, is you can actually store water on site, storm water from rooftops and then use that as irrigation water instead of using public water supply for irrigation. Does it really make sense to spend a bunch of money to treat water to the point where you can drink it and then spray it on a lawn? Is that really what we want to do? So these kinds of issues. And then of course, redevelopment usually results in less demand than uh, the prior land use. Questions for the municipality. How are you gonna drive all of these things? That's really what it comes down to. And then the questions for the applicant. Similarly, how are they going to reduce water demands? Through site layout, through low impact design, um, Col is, uh, is the concept there. And uh, will the development of chain lead certification? Lead certification is worth looking into because of 
its inclusion of water issues. So you might want to take a look into LEED and whether LEED can be incorporated into your regulatory process to drive developers to doing things a better way. I'm not gonna get into this, but the slide is available for you. All of this results in a series of planning evaluations from the uh, water, and, uh, water and planning document, but it all, faces, it all gets to the question of sustainable water systems. If you are not thinking in terms of how your, your society, how your county is going to have sustainable water resources a hundred years from now, then you're not thinking far enough. You really need to focus there. And so these are some of the ideas behind it. The critical point that I raise at the bottom here is that we need to get to a point where the public sees water resources protection improvement as a benefit to the community, not as something that stifles the community or stifles economic growth, but things that, but a, an idea that actually benefits the municipalities, benefits the county, benefits the economy, benefits the society, and benefits the environment. That requires a lot of thoughtful planning. So is this your vision of progress in your community? In many communities for many decades, it has been. But there are different ways of seeing things. If your floodplain floods, why not have it be a park? Maybe it already is a park, great. But one of the best things you can do in a floodplain is have it be an active or a passive recreation park. Using water within the community, so that you're using water, storm water, and so on as a resource. Using better designs, we've all seen the standard strip mall like you see on the left-hand drawing. There are ways of getting exactly the same amount of commercial value with designs that are more attractive, more environmentally beneficial, less damaging to water resources. I'm throwing up a lot of ideas here. Again, I'm not going to get into them at all because you can take a look at these slides later on, but it's food for thought. The notion of one water, how can you view water resources as a holistic resource, as something that you manage proactively to the benefit of the community? You can do that through green infrastructure. You can do that through water infrastructure improvements. You can do it through community planning with water in ways that will benefit your communities for decades, if not centuries. And it's not often that we talk about doing things for centuries, but we really should be because we have every reason to do that. So interesting little um, graphic with regard to one water, and it just gives you a sense of how water can be used, reused, stored, managed, taken advantage of for the benefit of the community. And with that, almost exactly one hour since I started, not quite, I come to my last slide, which is my information slide. And if anybody has ever found or seen the Cistern Chapel, I want to go there and visit. Thanks very much. <gasps> That was a great way to end that, Dan. Thank you. So um, as Dan mentioned, uh, we will send out uh, a copy of his slide presentation to you uh, along with the link to a survey. So now I'd like to open up the chat room for any questions you might have for Dan. So if you could uh, write your questions in the chat box. We're going to try and do it that way because um, we're going to see if that's a, a more efficient way to handle questions. So anybody who has their hand raised, if you could type your question into the chat box and we'll get to it. Okay, Dan, uh, we have a question here um, asking you to address water neutral development. 
Okay. Um, so water neutral development, like energy neutral development, would be a development that is entirely dependent on the water resources that can be created through that development, at least net. Um, so let me start with energy neutral development because this is, people tend to think of it as being off the grid where you have no access to the, the normal energy systems. That really isn't the norm for energy neutral development. It's, it's where sometimes you're giving to the system, sometimes you're taking back from the system, but over the course of an average year, you're energy neutral. What the energy you're generating on site offsets the energy that you're demanding from, from the grid. Similarly, in water resources perspective, you would be um, looking for a way of making use of on-site water resources to the extent possible, and then um, maybe giving back to the environment with regard to water resources as well, as well. So over time, you get this balance between your use. I have not seen a lot of, I'm not sure I've seen any true examples of 100% water neutral development. If there are any, I'd love to, to hear about it. But it's the sort of thing that would be extremely difficult to do on any small piece of property. Larger piece of property might be able to do it because then you're dealing with a combination of runoff and of groundwater recharge from that property that could be then used in that property, treated on that property, reused on that property, treated on that property, and so on and so forth. So it might work very well in a larger scale, like a campus, a corporate campus or something of that nature. Um, I wouldn't want to try it on, on a single family lot. Dan, we have another comment here. Uh, you mentioned five units to the acre as being high density. Uh, somebody points out that in Ramapo, it's a lot higher there. Mm -hmm. So those figures, um, Basically, the high density included everything from five units per acre to Newark, <laughs> which is like thousands of, well, it's what? We have, um, we have some areas that were included in figures that are 50,000 people per square mile uh, to give you a sense of, of the density involved there. So, um, so it included that whole range but the moderate density was two to five units per acre. And I think people would agree that that's, that's basically moderate density. So it was um, uh, one to two units per acre, two to five, and then five and up. So I, just to clarify that. Thank you. Um, another person asked, if your town or village doesn't have local ordinances, uh, that address um, good stormwater management or water conservation, what can a planning board member do to encourage this or to address these issues? Okay, so there are some great stormwater ordinances out there um, in New Jersey, uh, the uh, Sustainable Jersey program, which is a municipal sustainability uh, voluntary program, has a stormwater ordinance. It's been working with a number of others to improve that. What I would suggest is that you get a good model ordinance and start thinking through with people and talking with people about why can't we do this? Look at the advantages to doing this. We're going to be improving the su sustainability of our water resources. We're going to be protecting our streams. We're going to be protecting our groundwater supplies. And for a county that's 70% dependent on groundwater supplies, the notion that you're throwing away water and that's really literally what it is. It's throwing away water by letting it flood downstream very quickly in a rainfall event and not penetrate into the ground. You need that water. And stormwater management is the way of keeping that water. That's the key. So I would focus not, I would focus on the benefits of good stormwater management and also mentioning the harms of bad stormwater management. But uh, protecting your water supply, what can be more fundamental than that? So Dan, one more question that was, uh, you were referring to Sustainable New Jersey? It's called Sustainable Jersey. Jersey. They, they dropped the, uh, the new. So okay. it's sustainablejersey.org, all, okay. all run together. 
And just so people know, the, the county task force new conservation plan does talk about the need for looking for good model ordinances. So this is uh, potentially a great place to start. So another participant wants to hear your thoughts about the shift in Rockland County Department of Health's new demand models. Are you familiar with those, Dan? Nope. So I can't speak to that. I've, I have not, um, I've not been in touch with the folks of the Department of Health, um, I think it's fair to say, since uh, late 2017 when the report came out. Okay. So I'll have to skip that one, sorry. Okay. But that tells me that I should talk to them. Definitely. Um, can you address uh, measures that have been used uh, to protect the watershed in the New Jersey Highlands? Uh, yes, I have an entire presentation on that that we're not going to share tonight. Um, but uh, what I can do, Suzanne, actually, is I can send you a PDF of that. I gave a presentation to students, graduate students at the New Jersey Institute of Technology on that very topic. But just in general, the Highlands Regional Master Plan in New Jersey is very, very focused on water resources protection. That was the, a major reason for the creation of the council in 2004. And I was responsible for the science and planning staff in the Highlands Council when we created that regional plan and, and started implementing it. Um, a wide variety of, of things that we, we were doing in that plan and are being implemented. Riparian area protection, not just a fixed buffer, you know, 200 feet, 300 feet, 100 feet, but something that's more ecologically and hydrologically defined so that we're truly protecting the, both the ecosystem and the quality of the stream. Recharge protection. Um, I mentioned in my talk, uh, recharge protection was a very significant part of the regional master plan. Overcoming situations where we've been taking out too much groundwater from the watersheds of the highland. So there's actually a portion of the plan that requires new development to help reduce the deficits in the aquifers of the Highlands watershed where they're developing. So if you wanted 100,000 gallons per day of water for, water for your big development, then you would have to make sure that the situation, that all of that water basically was um, came from conservation or from increased recharge. So you have to offset your new demand in an area that already has a deficit. Not only 100%, but more than 100%. You actually have to make the situation better. So that's a concept there. Steep slope protection, um, because it gets at ero erosion issues. Um, wetlands protection is already very strong in New Jersey, so we didn't really have to do anything there. Um, Fair amount with regard to um, um, cluster development in areas with, with a lot of, of open space where there's development proposed, the notion of taking that development and putting it on 20% of the property and preserving the other 80% of the property. That property could be farmland, it could be forest, but the idea is to put the development on, on a small portion of the property and then develop and, um, and then preserve the rest of it. The, those are the things that immediately come off mind. It was a, a document that is about two inches thick. Um, I would not suggest it as like bedtime reading, um, but I, I will send you the slideshow. That would be great. I'm sure people would like to see that. So another viewer asked, how does Rockland compare to our neighboring counties in terms of uh, developing in floodplains? Um, in terms of historic, typical. The, let's face it, uh, floodplains were someplace where development fairly routinely went. The, the idea was, well, well it, it depends. If you go way back, a lot of development happened right next to streams because that's where the power was. That's where you put your grist mill, your saw mill, and so on, because it's, it's the only place that you had power. And then communities grew up around those, and so they were all at risk. Right? But that's a long time ago. 
more recently, yeah, we still have been up through in New Jersey, the early 70s, mid 70s, late 70s, still putting development into floodplains, even though we knew better, because there were no regulations prohibiting that. Now in New Jersey, there are, they're very quite, uh, quite stringent. Um, so I, I would say that Rockland is, is typical of suburban municipalities in the northeastern part of the, the country. So a viewer is uh, talking about saltwater intrusion on Long Island, in which overuse of wells draws mm -hmm. down the water table and allows ocean water to infiltrate water wells. And he's asking, has there been anything like this in Rockland? Um, I'm not aware of saltwater intrusion from the estuary in Rockland. Uh, we have had that in New Jersey in several places right along the Raritan Bay and in, in Cape May area all the way at the tip of New Jersey. The salt in New, in New York, uh, in Rockland County, that has caused the well closures has been road salt. Um, Rockland County, like everywhere else, a lot of roads. When you have a lot of roads, you have a lot of road salt. You have a lot of road salt, some of that gets into the groundwater. And if you have a concentrated enough area of, of use, then you can get contamination of your wells with, rock, with road salt. And that's what it was in, in Rockland County. So I'm not aware of anything um, right along the Hudson River um, from a Rockland County perspective. I am very much aware of the, the Long Island situation. And that's one of the reasons they created the Central Pine Barrens um, Reserve in Long Island to protect the recharge areas for their aquifer from development. Um, and that's, and they are also trying to control their well use. We did the same thing in New Jersey where we were having saltwater intrusion. We cut back the groundwater use by 50%. That's not a situation Rockland County wants to be in. Hmm. Dan, you mentioned in your talk, uh, something that I imagine uh, most people, uh, most of our viewers are aware of, which is that the biggest issue for Rockland right now is our peak demand, which is in the summertime. Mm -hmm. So uh, one uh, viewer asks, talks about the problem of watering lawns with drinking water. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done this for decades. No messaging has been sent to the public from any of our uh, local governments. And it seems that the financial cost of not making this change may be the only way to get attention uh, to focusing on this problem. Can you see a way to measure the impacts and cost of using our drinking water for watering our lawns? Right. So I've, I've looked at this in, in considerable detail in, in several different studies. <clears throat> and here's the issue. When you have an existing system that is capable of meeting demands, including peak demands, the marginal cost to the, tr to the utility of treating that extra water is a relatively small portion of the total cost of the water. Because the real cost of water is all of that infrastructure and the treatment plant itself and so on and so forth. So the, the extra costs of treating the, the peak demands are some energy, some chemicals, probably no additional staff, um, you know, that's about it. But if you get to a point where those peak demands are pushing you to create a new water use, uh, water supply, a new piece of infrastructure, an expansion of your system, that's when things get very expensive and the marginal costs of that increase in water capacity is high. So you never want to be in a situation where you're pushing yourself to that new cost, the creation of a brand new costly supply, a increase in your size of your treatment plant, something of that nature. So that's, that's really where, to, where it gets going. The, the real issue, um, and it's a very difficult one, is what sort of costs will get people to change their habits in terms of lawn irrigation and so on. Um, and the answer is that the people who are on the very low end of the economic spectrum don't tend to use a lot of water for this purpose. And the people on the higher end of the economic spectrum don't care. 
<laughs> or they don't have to care, I should say. Maybe they do care, but they don't have to care because the amount of water, the amount of money they spend on their water bill is irrelevant. All right. So it's really the people in the middle, which fortunately is most of the population, who might be moved by rates. And if you can combine a, a rate schedule that dings them for excessive summertime use and an educational program that makes them aware of it so that they understand how they can reduce their costs and you make it easy by helping them find ways of regulating their irrigation or understanding that they're over irrigating, which is all too common. Many two people over irrigate. Um, and I'm sure conservation, the uh, cooperative extension has been pushing that message for decades that you don't need to do a whole bunch of light waterings. You do one depth watering per week and then your lawn will be fine, you know, that sort of thing. So it's, it's a combination of making it apparent, making it easy and making it financially worthwhile. That's what will tend to get people to change. Um, and eventually you want to make it a social norm so that the people who are watering when they don't need to are um, hearing it from their neighbors, shall we say. Um, okay, another uh, participant is asking, how would a board member know when a project before them is not viable in terms of water usage? It's a good question. Um, the tendency in planning boards in New Jersey, I know, is you mandate that the applicant come to you with a letter from the water utility saying, we will serve this development, right? And that's what you know. Utility says they can serve them. Well, okay, then they can serve them. I would suggest that it is not at the development review step that this question needs to be asked. It's at the master planning step. When you can look at the build out uh, capacity for your community, let's say you have capacity for 5,000 additional homes. That's 15,000 additional people, let's say, 10 to 15. What are their water demands going to be? Do you have the capacity for that? demand. And then when each individual application comes before you, you simply want to be tracking to see whether or not those calculations are working out in the long run. That's the best way to approach it. Not piecemeal, but in a more holistic manner. And I've seen situations where there's a, you know, there's a six inch line in a road and that six inch line was just fine for the development that existed at the time. But then a whole new area opened up for development and that six inch line is no longer capable of handling the demands. And so a completely new line has to be laid. So that's the sort of thing that you can be thinking about ahead if you're willing to look at it and not rely on the utility to be Oz, right? The man behind the curtain, pull in all the levers and it just happens like magic. Um, that's really not a good place for a municipality to be, to be dependent on the utilities for deciding where development is going to go because of where they're going to serve that development. Um, okay, another uh, viewer is asking, uh, he's referring to the one water non-municipal border concept and ask, are there any known intermunicipal cooperative programs? Good question. Um, there are a few instances around the country where municipalities have gotten together to deal with stormwater management for a watershed. The Rouge River Cooperative in the Denver, uh, the, not Denver, Detroit, excuse me, the Detroit area, um, basically going out into the suburban areas of Detroit and, and then into the, into the Detroit area, was um, pretty successful at getting municipalities together and saying, well, all right, how are we going to bring this river back together? How are we going to improve the situation so that what we wind up with is a 
a resource, an amenity to our communities and not essentially a glorified storm sewer that's badly polluted because of all the storm water going into it. So there are, there are situations like that um, where it's been successful. Um, I've seen things on the county level where a county um, takes the lead and then works with the municipalities to figure out where growth is most appropriate and least appropriate. So that can be a very valuable situation so that you don't have every municipality trying to figure it out on their own. You have um, a single sort of coordinating body, not a decision-making body, but a coordinating effort from the county level that gets everybody together. Um, sort of like the Rockland Water Task Force has done with regard to its specific area. But there are other ways that, that the same concept can be used. Well, I'm sure you know, Dan, that um, we do have a, a county master plan, but we also have home rule. Mm -hmm. so that's, you know, that's the issue, is the, those two conflicting um, sort of forces, if you will. New Jersey is very much the same. Um, but one of the examples that I'm, I'm bringing out is Somerset County in New Jersey, where the county planning board is very well thought of by its municipalities. They have a routine grant pro uh, program to their municipalities to help them with smart growth. They, they, in fact, are the planning board for one of the municipalities where the county seat is. So they, the county planning board is actually also the local staff for the, for the municipal planning board. Um, and so they, they have, they've developed a strong enough relationship with their municipalities that when they said, okay, you know, let's, let's all get together and figure out where the really the best places for economic growth are and the best places for preservation are, the municipalities work together to do that. That's powerful when you can do that. So it's not a matter of the county imposing on, it's the matter of the county being a facilitator. Hmm. And it worked in their case. Um, another person asked, um, are there municipalities in New Jersey that have limited or encouraged in-ground automat automated irrigation systems? New Jersey now has a law that says if you're going to have a, an automated irrigation system, it must be controlled to ensure that, um, for instance, if it's raining, your irrigation system is not on. If the soil is, is, you know, is very wet, that irrigation system is not on. So that's state law at this point for any new automated irrigation system. Um, I'm not familiar with any municipality specifically taking a front role with that. I think people have relied on the state legislation. There was a pilot project down in K May County where they were doing something along this line, but I don't recall the details. Okay, we have a lot of questions here, Dan. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. oh, so, I got another glass of water. <laughs> oh, um, so someone asked, uh, why haven't we put in systems to use gray water in New York State? Ah, really good question. And the answer is, if you look at where gray water is being used, it is being used where they have no choice. So if you look at Florida, Tampa Bay area, Tampa Bay area was seeing saltwater intrusion. It was running out of water. It needed, it was growing like crazy. And so it needed a water, a new water supply. What do you do? And the, one of the answers is, and just one of the answers, there were multiple answers, but one of the answers was that they put a second set of lines down the street and brought treated wastewater back to, um, in that case, it's not gray water, it's black water, but it's treated wastewater back to use for lawn irrigation. That's very expensive. There are um, individual buildings that use uh, gray water. They, they will use um, sink water and so on for, um, with a, a minor amount of treatment, you can use that for um, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems. And so uh, there's some places in Battery Park City, for instance, in New York City, that use gray water for that purpose. They use storm water for that purpose. Um, 
and they also treat uh, sewage from within the building and then reuse that for toilets. So there, there are systems like that. The key is it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Where's the benefit? In the case of New York City, it was they reduced their water demands, they reduced their sewer demands. And so the, the result was they paid for this additional treatment and this recycling system through lower water and sewer charges. It worked for them. In some places it'll work, in some places it won't work. So wastewater reuse is something that people talk about all the time, not terribly viable in this area except for special situations. Gray water reuse, the, the problem is what are you gonna reuse it for? If you're going to recycle sink water to use in your toilets, probably can do it, but um, that raises issues with regard to modifying the plumbing and so on. Is it really going to be worth it? Using it for, for lawn irrigation, I think you're going to have a problem because in that case, you'd have to treat it to the point where you can have public exposure to it. And even gray water has biological contaminants. Um, so someone has a question about um, the fact that the Ramapo watershed extends from Rockland, actually mm -hmm. from Orange and Rockland into New Jersey. So um, Upper Saddle River and Mawa are directly downstream from Rockland. So this person asks, who do we contact if there's a problem in the watershed and we suspect it comes from Rockland or further north? <laughs> so who are you going to call? Ghostbusters, right? Um, the, the answer is that um, New York and New Jersey do interact through their, the Department of Environmental Protection in New Jersey and the Department of Environmental Conservation in New York to deal with these cross-border issues. There are two. One is that New York is um, committed by law, essentially, uh, by, by state agreement, to ensure that a certain amount of flow comes down the Ramapo River from New York into New Jersey, and from the Hackensack River from New York and into New Jersey. So those things are, are basically locked in stone. The other part, though, is quality. And that's much more complicated, because New Jersey has no enforcement rights with regard to water quality in New York State. And so if there's a water quality problem that's coming over the border into Mawa, then the DEP would have to get in touch with the DEC and ask them to, to deal with it. If it were something that was routine, not just every once in a while, that was causing a major issue, and if New York State refused to deal with it, then um, the next step would be that New Jersey would have to go to EPA, Region 2 head, headquarters in New York, and say, you're in charge of the nation's waters. We have an interstate issue. We need you to intercede. So that's how it works from a legal perspective. So first step is cooperative. And only if the cooperative step doesn't work, does, um, would there be a next step up to the federal level? So Dan, you might know that some five years ago or so, there was the Bi-State Water Commission, mm -hmm. uh, which was made up of representatives of New York State and New Jersey. Um, I think it was largely around the Hackensack watershed. And I believe the purpose was to discuss and potentially manage flooding. Do you know the status of that commission? I haven't heard a word about it in years. So no, I, I'm not aware of, of any activity with that at all. Okay. Uh, and of course, in the meantime, we've had a change in governor um, and it could well have, have just completely dropped off the agenda for all I know. I don't know. Uh, someone asked, you had mentioned uh, road salt as being one of the factors that's contaminated some of the wells in Rockland. So uh, someone here asked, is the brine that's used now um, during snowfalls, is that a better option than salt? 
If it's managed properly, yes. So we've, we have a lot of experience with Brian uh, in New Jersey, around the country, and you can have on the order of a 40% reduction in total salt use if you use brine properly. And the reason is a lot of the rock salt that gets put on roads bounces off. And you've, we've all seen it, right? You, there's, the, there's the truck going down the road and the, the uh, whirly gig on the back of it is spinning like crazy and it's throwing out rock salt. And the next dozen cars that go by this rock salt is getting pushed off to the side of the road where it's useless. Brine tends to stay where it's put and that's in the road system itself. It's also, because it's liquid, it is more effective at melting snow and ice immediately. And it serves, if you lay it down as we've all seen, the, the stripes on the road, if you lay it down before the snowfall, it makes it easier for the snow plows to pop the snow off the road surface because the, the brine creates a, a liquid layer in between the road and the, the snow. And so the snow tends to pop off when the snow plow hits it. So for all of these different reasons, brine is a very significant improvement to um, salt use for snow. The other thing that would be an improvement, of course, is, and I, you can see this if you go to Cape Cod, in Massachusetts, and you can see it if you go to Connecticut and you go across um, Route 95. There are stretches where they drastically reduce their road um, treatment with salt because it's in a water supply area, in the case of Connecticut's reservoirs, or it's in a cranberry bog area, in the case of uh, Cape Cod. And cranberry bogs are highly sensitive to salt. They can really damage the, the crop. So um, in those cases, they've, they've sort of done a balancing act between public safety and environmental harm. So the brine salt is the first thing I would go with. And then if that doesn't do the job in terms of knocking down the, the demands enough, then um, thinking about how you can still protect public health or pay public safety, but even further reduce the use of red salt is, is worth looking into. Thank you. Um, here's a question about uh, hydrant requirements. Could you comment on how to balance hydrant requirements and infrastructure with actual normal water use? And do you know how water utilities handle this? Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is because hydrants are, are put in places primarily for fire protection they should be used for fire protection. That's their primary use. They really shouldn't be used for, for normal purposes. The only other major use of hydrants is for line flushing, which tends to happen in the springtime to, to flush out some of the uh, you know, deposit buildup that you might have in a, in a water supply line. So I'm not really sure how this relates to water demand. Okay, maybe the um, person who wrote that question could um, give us a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of questions about how our own county Department of Health um, manages the willingness to serve letter that uh, the utility Suez issues. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm not sure if you can speak to that, Dan. I'm not aware of the, the internal administrative process there. Okay. I, I, I can certainly assume that um, the utility is responsible for making sure that if they say they can serve, they can serve. But the question is, what are the limitations on their ability to say that? And I don't know how that works. Okay. Actually, this issue had come up at a water task force meeting not too long ago. It seems to be um, an ongoing concern, and maybe the task force uh, can address that at some point in the near future. You know, at this point, um, since we do have a few more minutes. I was thinking maybe we could unmute people and allow them to ask any other questions. If somebody wants to... Yeah, I don't know if you have a raise hands function or something. Yeah, like that. we do. So let me ask... 
Mr. Keegan. Mr. Keegan. So I'm, I think I'm going to stop screen sharing. Okay. There we go. All right. Uh, let me try. Let's see. I know. I had one other. Arlene. Arlene. Yes. Hi. Did you have a question or a comment? Do I have a que I don't have a question. No. Did you have a comment? I I have a general comment, and that is that I think that this has been a really uh, fantastic presentation, and I think it you know really uh, Dr. Van Abs did a great job in getting inter uh, relating the planning aspects with the water aspects. So I think it can be understood in a better layman's terms. Thank you. Um, I do see a, um, a follow on with regard to the hydrants and it's, okay. it is a broader issue. Okay. So the question was how to forecast water demand for non-constant uses like hydrants. So there is um, in the water supply world, um, something called the American Water Works Association water loss accounting method. And what it does, in, and Suez, by the way, uses this method. What it does is looks at all of the various uses of water and how they compare to the total amount of water that's put into the system to determine how much water uh, that they put in or that any utility puts in is, does not come up as a billable water demand, all right? So what goes to residential customers and commercial customers and so on gets logged on their meters, but there's a bunch of water uses that does not. Some of those water uses are things like fire suppression. And so a utility over the course of time will get a pretty good sense as to how much water is going to be used for fire suppression within a municipality in the average year. They will have a very good sense of how much water is used for um, flushing the water lines, which they have to do periodically. So these are all um, these kinds of inconstant demands like hydrants. In some places, you have a big influx or outflow of residents because they're seasonal. And so you need to understand what the seasonal demands are. Um, and so if, if you have an area with a lot of snowbirds, then when they leave, your demands go down. And when they come back, your demands go up. Um, so all of these kinds of things, a utility it basically um, through a combination of tracking their metered demands and then seeing what else is going on can get an understanding of these non-revenue water demands one portion of which is leakage. So it, it isn't all leakage. Some of it's leakage. Some of it is authorized, but unmetered demands like fire suppression and cleaning um, and so on. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask, um, let's see, Laurie Seaman. Laurie. Laurie Seaman, are you there? Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Dan. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Laurie, could you just uh, ask your question, please? Does yeah. Hi. hi, Dan. I'm here with someone who's a landscaper. Mm -hmm. And um, that industry has, from his perspective, has a lot of potential for helping us with this water equation. Um, they already are working, you know, on those larger parcels that you've identified as having a, a larger impact on the summer water use. A lot of those larger parcels have landscaping companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's this question of they're already putting in uh, waterfalls and water systems. They're working with stormwater runoff on the property, even putting it um, into underground storage. Um, and he says that they, they just absolutely are not connected 
with the larger picture of having impact on water, um, drinking water or on storm water reduction. And he watches this as like, as a person who understands the correlation. He's been watching for years since we were in the no desal efforts and asking people to be aware, you know, it goes on year by year by year. And um, it's, not there's just, it's just not connecting. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know some efforts have been made. I'm, I, I'm, I myself am aware of a bit of it. I know even Suzanne, you know, Cornell gives tutorials and, you know, certificates, I'm sure. But I think anybody who was on this call, um, and there's many more of us who understand the significance of not talking about change anymore, but making a higher demand for it and seeing it happen, um, where can we look to for um, impressing on the decision makers, the enforcers, the legislators, everybody who's involved that um, uh, we're beyond a point of personal option. Like we have got to find a way to position all the people in this chain of one water, which I love that your talk is one water, um, to think that way. Can you can you help us in any way with any any uh, hope from anywhere that you've seen? Sure. Um, so go, let me go back to two points that I made before. One is the um, the lead program from the U.S. Green Building Council. More and more um, commercial developers even multifamily project developers are seeing LEED certification as a way of distinguishing their projects and uh, being seen as a, a place where people should uh, pay rent <laughs> uh, or make a purchase or whatever it happens to be over somebody who doesn't have LEED certification. LEED certification is driving people toward thinking about these concepts, um, about tying in water conservation, better water use, and so on. The other part that I would, would mention is the easiest thing to mandate is something that people see as a benefit because then the answer is going to be, well, yeah, of course, why not? Um, and so one of the things that I would suggest is thinking seriously about how to show examples where people will look at it and say, wow, isn't that great? And then you can ask the question, but why aren't we doing more of it? Mm -hmm. So that's the, it's a stepwise progression because if you hit it, people with this notion that we should just require X, um, if they don't know what X is, then a large number of people are going to reject it. Perfect. But if they do know what X is and they've seen it and it's wonderful, then they'll say, well, yeah, I mean, that makes all sorts of sense. So that's, that's the sort of process that you want to get into. So my hope is that, um, that the landscaping community um, and the landscape architects, I know that uh, the, the American Society of Landscape Architects is really big into this whole issue of green infrastructure, of uh, proper management of water demand in um, the spaces that they deal with. So the more you can get those folks out there beating the drum first <clears throat> from a business perspective, I think the better off you're going to be. Sounds good. We'll start with the one then. Sometimes yeah. all it takes is one great example, and then you, you just your words. Thank beat, you. beat the drum like crazy. Yeah, thank you so much. Take a video of it. Send it to everybody. Okay. So, Dan, I had a question. I, I w was wondering if you could clarify something. So you were talking about the Ramapo watershed as having the greatest constraints. Mm -hmm. Even though you showed us the Hackensack watershed, which had far less forest cover, far more compromised streams mm -hmm. than the Ramapo. So can you explain why Ramapo is more constrained or? Uh, right. and, and the answer is because of the heavy concentration of wells in the Buried Valley Aquifer in the Ramapo and the Mawa. 
um, those wells are inducing flow from the river into the wells. And so that means that what happens to the surface water happens to the groundwater. What happens to the groundwater happens to the wells. Mm -hmm. That's a major concern. With the Hackensack, you have a very different situation because it's a, it's a surface water demand uh, system. You have um, Lake DeForest, you have the Nyack um, intake that is downstream of that, and then downstream of that you have the Suez, New Jersey reservoir systems, all very much surface water focused. And the expectation with surface water is that you have to, reach, you have to treat that. You need, you need very high levels of treatment for that. So it's a very different system, groundwater in the Rompopo, surface water in the Hackensack. In terms of the total level of contamination, the Hackensack has a large um, concentration of non-point source pollution, but I'm not aware of any sewage treatment plant that discharges to the Hackensack River in Rockland County, because there you're so close to the Hudson River that those are, those are Hudson discharges. In the Ramapo, you have at least two treatment plants plus the ones in Orange County that are discharging to the river. And so you're seeing a different kind of pollutant stress in the Ramapo Basin than you are in the Hackensack Basin. Okay, thank you. Um, so one viewer writes, success in many of these water planning issues will depend on motivating local elected officials. Can you suggest a few local examples similar to our demographic, specifically with regard to stormwater and redevelopment issues uh, where we, they might be inspired? Good question. Um, the best intermunicipal regional program that I've seen in the, the immediate region was in the Great Swamp watershed of New Jersey. And they had what they called the 10 Towns Committee. That's called the 10 Towns Committee because there were 10 towns on it. But they comprised the entire Great Swamp watershed, which is an up, the, it's a headwaters area of the Passaic River Basin. And what they did is they turned it into a competition. They decided as a committee that they needed to better protect the environment in that area. It's a natural wildlife refuge, it's headwaters of the Passaic River Basin and so on. Um, they decided that they needed to do a better job. And so they came up with a series of ordinances that they wanted to put in place. And they started keeping track of which municipalities were doing the best job at doing that. Hmm. So it was, if you got a green, that meant you were doing a great job. If you got a yellow, it meant you were doing part of the job. If you were still red, that meant you, you just hadn't done anything yet. And it became a competition between the municipalities to be all green. It worked very, very well. So these are the sort of things that can be done. The other thing that could be done, um, and this gets back to like the Rouge River project that I mentioned, but that's not close, is is to establish a watershed-based target. What are we looking to achieve in this watershed? What are we looking to achieve in the Hackensack? What are we looking to achieve in the Ramapo? And um, figuring out what each of the municipalities should be doing in order to meet that target. A municipality that has almost no development will have almost no um, burden. A municipality with a lot of development will have more burden. Right. And so, again, it's a matter of setting targets and then encouraging people through competition and through a bit of peer pressure, if you will, to um, to um, move forward and to show that they're doing the right thing for the right reason. Thank you. Um, I mean, here in Rockland, we don't really think, I think, in terms of watershed so much. Mm hmm. I think people think of their village or town or the county. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, well, it's, it's how my world works is I'm constantly dealing with that particular problem. <laughs> okay, can you uh, talk about how to protect the federal sole, sole source aquifer um, and thereby protecting the New York State primary aquifer? in terms of uh, protecting vacant lands? So um, 
one of the things that we did in the Highlands Council is uh, we used a, a method that was developed by the New Jersey Geological Survey. My guess is it would work in New York because you have the same, you, Rockland County has the same geology as Northern New Jersey. We identified the best of the recharge areas in the Highlands region. Um, and we then um, established priority for those to be uh, preserved. And where development is, um, is proposed, we required through the regional master plan that the development be moved away from the primary recharge, the primary charge area, and into the, the lower recharge portions of the, par of the parcel, right? So there are ways you can do this. It's, when you say sole source aquifer, 80% of New Jersey is in one sole source aquifer or another. And so you can't just protect it all. So the idea is to find out those lands that are most critical from a recharge perspective and protect those. And I think our, our New Jersey Geological Survey method, as I said, it's the same geology, it's much the same soils, can probably be used in Rockland County to, to help do that. Okay. I just want to ask Deborah, uh, Deborah Munitz. Okay, she had a question. I want to make sure that uh, it was answered. All right, actually, Dan, I think we've come to the end of our questions. If there's anybody else who has one, please raise your hand now and I'll unmute you. So I'm getting uh, back to the question from Deborah Munitz. I'm, I'm reading through her question okay. now. And the, the answer is that um, when, when a utility is looking at how much water is needed to serve a particular development, they are multiplying it by, they're, they're multiplying it, the, the water that's actually demanded by the unit by a factor. And that factor deals with two things. One is the, um, the need for peak demands. So it's not enough to say, well, you're gonna use 100 gallons per person per day or 70 gallons per person per day. You have to fact factor in the peak demands that occur. And the other part of that, that multiplication is to incorporate the needs for all of the other things that are not um, built, that are not part of a billable water use. And so fire suppression is one of those. So there's, there's a, a pretty standard approach that utilities use to make sure that they have a, a sufficient capacity to deal with, with both um, types of peak demands, the user peak and also the emergency peaks. So at this point, I'm gonna ask if anyone else in the audience has a final question for Dan. And I just wanna remind you that I will be sending out uh, his PowerPoint presentation, as well as a second one, right, on the uh, Hudson mm -hmm. Islands, and also a link to a survey that I'll ask you all to complete. But if I don't hear uh, of any more questions, I want to thank you, Dan, for uh, your very comprehensive presentation. Uh, it was clear and compelling. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Keegan? Uh Hold on, I'm right here. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go right. Oh, ahead. good, fine. Uh, yes, it, it, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Van Abs. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. Listen, it brings up so many concerns. I, I'm I'm on uh, a zoning board member, and when you uh, have uh, applicants in front of you, I mean to ask yourself what's going to happen a hundred years from now, <laughs> you know, it, it's, I mean, it, there has to be some other mechanism that you can depend on to, to give you answers and things like this. this is such a, this is a science. This isn't just a regulation or something. This is an entire science that, that, that has to be grappled with. Yes. And, and frankly, um, it's more often going to be the planning board that can deal with these issues on a more generic basis 
uh, let's let's if if the zoning board of adjustment is is what you're meaning, um, there the in New Jersey at least the zoning board of adjustment is is quite constrained in terms of what it can do and not do compared to the the planning board. Um, so I I agree with you. It, the a lot of these issues need to be dealt with at a, a higher scale and prior to a development coming in the door. Because once a development comes in the door, they have certain expectations that are based in law and you're, you'll have a limited amount of uh, ability to, to tweak that proposal unless it's required by something. Exactly. Okay, thank you so much, Don. You're very welcome. So what you're really saying, Dan, is that we need to change the laws. <laughs> and <the second laughs> regulations yeah, yeah well the, definitely the um if if you really want to have the power to affect development it has to be in the ordinance that's just the the whole sum of it but if you really want ordinances that do the right job you have to figure out what the right job is exactly all right. Well, I think um, we're drawing to an end here. So, Dan, again, I want to thank you uh, for presenting tonight, um, for giving us a lot to think about, but particularly for all the questions that you so clearly laid out uh, and you interspersed uh, in your presentation on questions for the municipality and for the land use board members. I think those are really going to be helpful. Um, so um, everybody will get those so you can uh, hopefully take them and try them out on your own land use board. <laughs> so again, thank you all for coming. I, uh, we will have additional presentations on uh, related topics in the future, uh, but thank you again for joining us tonight. And thank you, Dan. Thank you. Good evening all. <laughs>